The plan, I, I just like to always lay out the plan for the talk at the beginning so everyone knows what's uh, coming. Um, I'm going to talk in general about uh, the book I'm working on, about Edward Brennan and uh, his transformation of the city. Um, talk a little bit about some general examples of uh, what I call reading the grid, um, seeing the city itself as a kind of text. Um, then I'm going to dive into some specific things about Edgewater, especially uh, some street names, um, which uh, have very interesting histories. Um, that'll be in a context of a larger uh, framing conversation about street names and ethnic and American identity and how that plays out uh, in the grid. Uh, I should know, and then there'll be time for Q&A at the end. Uh, John, I believe, will be moderating Q&A in chat. Um, and then it'll be 1230 and you'll all be wanting to get out of the house. So we'll be done. Um, the one thing I do have to say in, at the beginning, I always do, um, there is no way to avoid getting political in the conversation I'm about to have with y'all because it was a political conversation, changing street names, um, for instance. Um, so the standard disclaimer, um, any opinions I express are mine and mine alone and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Northwestern University, uh, the Edgewater Historical Society or Major League Baseball. It's just me. Um, so the title, the working title of my book is uh, The City Logical or Why Daniel Burnham is Way Overrated. Um, I'm expecting to get some pushback from the press on the subtitle. Um, the idea is that Chicago, because of the way it grew, um, has a, a street grid that people have a lot of, people, uh, Chicagoans who have been here forever or uh, people who come to town and try to learn the place um, have a lot of uh, uh, opinions about, and some of those opinions are not true, like the idea that the grid is monotonous and completely regular and everything is east, west, north, south. Uh, no, there's lots of angle streets, there's lots of interruptions to the grid. Um, but what's true is you always know where you are in relation to State and Madison based on house numbers or addresses. Um, and that is something that is utterly transformative in, if you look at back at Chicago history. Um, you also can read the history of the city's geography in the grid, um, Clark Street and Ridge, for instance, being old prehistoric beaches and that were later Native American trails that were then early plank roads because they were high and dry and well-drained. Um, you can actually experience the celestial because of the grid. We're only a few uh, week or two past um, uh, Chicago Henge, they call it, by the equinox, when the sun sets and you look on an east-west street at the sunrise or the sunset and it's framed as it would have been by Stonehenge in England. Um, and of course, the grid also obliterates the celestial for us. We, our view of the stars is remarkably uh, occluded by all the street lights and alley lights, which have their own interesting history. Um, so the idea behind my book is I'm going to be looking at the grid's exceptions and the grid's quirks as entree into writing about larger historical uh, matters. So for instance, um, one of the rules of the grid that Edward Brennan instituted that you all are either instinctively or consciously aware of, um, which side of the street have odd and which side of the street have even street numbers. So north and west sides of streets have even, east and south sides have odd. But if you go down Clark Street or LaSalle, south of uh, North Avenue and north of Division, you will notice that this seems not to be the case. You have odd numbered uh, addresses on the east side of, uh, pardon me, west side of Clark Street. And on LaSalle, there's actually a point where you have even numbered uh, things on the east side, right next to odd numbered things on the east side. And that is because those buildings, their address is actually Sandbrook Terrace, which is uh, basically a private road that runs between LaSalle and Clark Street um, in the Sandbrook Village uh, condominium and rental development. Um, that will let me talk about uh, urban renewal and how a, a diverse neighborhood with a lot of class and ethnic and racial diversity <clears throat> was obliterated by the city and turned over to private developers. And so that's why the addresses get reversed in this sort of weird looking way. Um, or far on the south side, you might be familiar with the fact that between Halstead and Archer and uh, 31st Street, a big triangle, um, the streets don't run due north, south, east, west. They run at an angle from the northwest to the southeast or the other way around, I suppose. Um, that's because that part of town was laid out before the rest of the grid got there. And it was laid out the way streets tended to be laid out in uh, more traditional 
more traditionally built environments than Chicago, which was you laid them out toward their destination. And the destination was the uh, canal being dug in the 1830s by Irish immigrants who weren't welcome to live in the city of Chicago. So they settled in Bridgeport, which then was outside the city limits. So that is a whole entree into that sort of ancient history of Chicago. And there's one piece of uh, the oldest uh, history of Chicago, the uh, Street Rogers up in Rogers Park, um, actually traces the Indian boundary line from the initial treaty that gave the federal government um, access to the area 10 miles on either side of, Lake, uh, of the Chicago River. And so that street with its weird angle that has nothing to do with geography is like the oldest street in, in the city. Um, the oldest thing written on a map that became a reality. So that's what the, the book as a whole is about. Um, the subtitle though, I think deserves a little attention. Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the idea of the city beautiful. Um, Daniel Burnham um, and his, his crew writing that book in 1909, coincidentally the same year that Edward Brennan finally gets his goals accomplished. Um, and the plan of Chicago um, helped, helped transform the city in many fundamental ways, um, helped create the very idea of urban planning uh, the idea that uh, private property has to maybe somehow be balanced against the public good. Um, and that if you do that, even though you're the owner of a big factory, maybe you'll actually make more money rather than less. Um, and we should design the city so it's easy to get around in transportation wise, um, so that you don't have, you know, delivery trucks at the same level as pedestrians. Um, and you have parks because people need parks. Um, although we forget the political import of parks, which was to give the working class somewhere to go to blow off some steam rather than organizing unions and rising up. Um, but the plan of Chicago, if you actually read it, the vast majority of it never happens. Um, the whole downtown was supposed to be double-decked. Um, we have Wacker and parts of Michigan and a few other streets downtown that do have an upper and lower level. Um, but that was supposed to be every place because Burnham wanted to you know, have the delivery trucks in, in the lower level where it's dirty and smoky and awful and have the upper level be a promenade for beauty and, you know, pleasure. Um, we were supposed to have a, the, sit, the center of the city in Burnham's plan would have been the intersection of uh, what is now Ida B. Wells or the, uh, later the Eisenhower Expressway and Halstead. There was going to be a, a central uh, plaza with all the government buildings, including a city hall that would be bigger than the U.S. Capitol, which I suppose would make sense if it included the jail to lock up Crooked Alderman. They would need that much room probably. Um, and that never got built. Uh, Burnham also wanted to blast through all the neighborhoods like Hausman did in Paris and put in diagonal streets that would connect everything. Um, he explicitly writes that Chicago has no architecture worth saving. Just tear down whatever you need to tear down in order to build these things. That never happens. Um, so the, but the lakefront parks happen not the way Burnham planned them. Burnham planned them with a lot more uh, boating facilities and with uh, streetcars in them and all sorts of stuff that we now think of as taboo. Um, but the, the plan of Chicago has turned into this kind of scripture, where anything you want to do in the city, if you just say, well, it's in the plan of Chicago, it becomes, you know, prima facie, a, a good thing to do. If you look back at some of the planning documents from the Richard J. Daly era, there's always an introduction that references the plan of Chicago, almost always in the first paragraph. Um, it's sort of, again, urban scripture rather than uh, ideas to be engaged. And for instance, one idea that's mentioned um, that goes contrary to the make no little plans mantra associated with Burnham is uh, the streets have to be meticulously maintained, spotlessly clean and free of potholes. So if that part of the Burnham plan were ever enacted, I think we could all get on board. Um, but that is, doesn't seem to be what people are interested in. They're interested in the big, they're interested in the monumental, uh, the, the magnificent reshaping of the whole city. But the city that Burnham was writing about, while well, he was primarily interested in, you know, commercial transportation and pollution and less, way less interested in housing, although original drafts of the, the plan did include uh, social services and, uh, you know, neighborhood organizations and all sorts of things that got cut because it was thought not to be part of the, uh, the way to uh, persuade Chicago's elite to go along with these expensive programs. Um, so it did have a social angle that later was taken away. But the city was totally incomprehensible. The city was chaos um, in a physical way, but also in this textual way that um, I'm referencing. Um, so at the same time that, I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. At the same time that Burnham and uh, his partner Edward Bennett are writing the plan of Chicago, uh, Edward Paul Brennan um, is attempting to convince 
uh, the city council to uh, change Chicago's street numbering system because Chicago didn't have a street numbering system. Um, because the city had uh, grown in the 1880s by rapid annexation of other communities, including Rogers Park, Edgewater, um, the town of Lake, uh, Hyde Park, you know, we basically went from what we now think of as kind of the center of the city out to its current edges um, in the build up to the 1893 fair. Um, and so each of these municipalities had its own street numbering system and its own street names. Um, the names tended to include lots of duplications. I will get to some of the more amusing ones shortly. Uh, but, you know, every town is going to name streets after Lincoln and Washington, right, and, you know, other political sort of automatics. Um, the numbering system for houses tended to come from bodies of water. Um, so just use an example from Rogers Park, the addresses started at the lake. I used to live on Loyola, about 50 yards from the lake. And my address was, would have been in the 100 block, the zero to 100 block. Um, currently it's 10 hundred. Um, now I live, as some, one of you knows very well, about 50 yards from the lake, but at Birchwood. And so I'm the same distance from the lake, but my address is 13 hundred block because the lake swoops in this way. So the addresses wouldn't line up block to block. And if you're looking for a particular house number, you might have to, you might go way out of your way to try to find it. Um, and this was the case all over town. Uh, in other parts of town, the, the street numbers came from the river and the river also curves and turns. Um, sometimes it was, the street numbers grew as you went east, sometimes they grew as you went west. Um, it was just chaos. And Brennan knew this firsthand because his first job was as a delivery boy for his father's grocery store. And later he worked as an executive, uh, sort of a middle manager type at uh, Lion and Healy, the music store that was also sort of a general department store. And <clears throat> This is before everyone had cars and went and bought stuff and took it home with them. You would go and buy something and the store would deliver it to your house um, if they could find your house. Um, and maybe they couldn't find your house because they mixed up Lincoln Street and Lincoln Avenue, which intersected, by the way, on the north side. Um, so this, you know, the, the plan that, again, most of you are very familiar with this, just sort of either instinctively or by learning it, um, stayed in Madison is the zero point of a Euclidean grid laid out over the city that grew randomly and chaotically. Um, numbers get bigger as you go north or south of Madison Street uh, and east or west of, Clark's, of uh, State Street. Um, as I already said, east and south sides have uh, uh, odd numbers, north and west sides have even numbers. Um, the, and the idea was that Brennan promoted now can be understood sort of as in, in the information age we live in, as putting all the information you need to find something in the name of the place. So north, south, east, west tells you what quadrant of town. Um, and then the number tells you what side of the street you wanna be on. Um, he wanted to make it even more explanatory, pack more information in there. He wanted all streets, uh, anything called a street would run east, west, anything called an avenue would run uh, north, south. Um, diagonal streets would be roads. And he had a whole elaborate scheme for like streets that are between other streets and angle streets and all, I mean, which side of town you were on. Um, that luckily never came to pass because it would have been too complicated. And actually the north, south, east, west thing never happened either. Um, because of course that would have meant changing State Street to State Avenue. And people objected because it had always been State Street. You know, it's that, it, even before the song called it a great street, it would have ruined the rhyme for that. Um, people, one of the things I learned doing this research, mostly at the Chicago Hist Historical Society, Okay, I just went away, I'm back. I don't know what happened. I don't know if my internet went out briefly. I'm gonna set up backup internet right now. Hang on, sorry everybody. Okay, I've got backup internet ready to go now. Um, did everybody else go away or was it just me? Just me? Okay, well I'm back. Um, I think I was mid-sentence about how uh, sentimental people are uh, doing the research at the History uh, Museum. One of the things I learned at the Chicago Historical Society, thank you, Hale, is uh, people are really sentimental about street names in a way that frankly is kind of odd. Uh, but then when you see some of the arguments people have about street names, it begins to make a little more sense. Um, so 
I'm going to dive in now to some of the, the uh, conversations about street names. Um, my screen is sharing. That's okay. Thank you. I'm, by the way, I'm trying not to look at the chat because it's distracting. Um, so I'm going to dive in now, and sorry about the little stumble here. Um, dive in now to uh, some stories about particular street names that illustrate maybe the dark side of the sentimentality people feel about their streets. Um, many of you are probably familiar with controversy over Pulaski uh, Road, 4000 West. Uh, Pulaski Road was originally Crawford, and I'm going to, I'm sharing my other screen here. Where is that? Uh, sorry, this is always good. Um, one, I, like I said, I learned you cannot uh, provide, um, can't have too much. And now, of course, I'm forget. There we go. Kelly Pulaski. Nope, nope. Um, you can't have too much set up or Zoom crashes. So here's a uh, political cartoon from 1937 about how people perceived the, the name change from Crawford to Pulaski. Uh, Crawford had been a, uh, a farmer in Chicago. Um, I don't know if someone's telling me something. The cartoon is not visible. Now it's not visible still? Nope, okay, well then I'm going to have to be really unhappy. Not really, I'll just go, I'll just stop doing that. I'll go back to my original share. Technology is not my friend. Um, so I'm just gonna leave Paul Brennan up here because he's better to look at than to look at me. Um, so Pulaski was uh, Crawford Road. Crawford was named for a, um, um, a sort of a guy who owned some land in the neighborhood, which is a very common thing. Uh, and Polish American immigrants uh, sort of pushed uh, Mayor Ed Kelly to name it for Pulaski, um, which he did. Uh, and it was perceived as a political giveaway. The cartoon I was trying to show you had Pulaski as, or uh, Kelly as Santa Claus handing a, uh, a present to Miss Polonia under the Christmas tree um, and pocketing uh, 40,000 Polish folks. And under the Christmas tree was another package wrapped up with a German street name on it, uh, potentially to be given to German immigrants. Um, the interesting thing about this is that uh, while it's commonly known and very controversial, and you can see it's controversy in the fact that when uh, parts of the town that are not Chicago um, uh, are inside Chicago city limits or just outside, the road goes back to Crawford. Um, people uh, tried to hide their anti-Polish uh, sentiment um, by claiming it was about you know, valuing the pioneers of Chicago. The only problem with that was those pioneers of Chicago, uh, that guy did nothing. He was nobody special. He just happened to own some land. Um, but what I found in doing this research, and this is frankly my favorite discovery um, in this process, is that this is the second time that there was controversy over changing a road to Pulaski. Uh, the first time was in 1913, when one of the most egregious uh, examples of um, multiple street namings was attempted to be rectified. Um, what is now Walcott used to be Lincoln Street. And it ran much of the length of the city from the near south side all the way up to Ravenswood. And at Grace, um, it crossed Lincoln Avenue. So you had a Lincoln Street and a Lincoln Avenue that were not only parallel, they intersected. So this is the kind of chaos that Edward Brennan was interested in getting rid of. Um, think about what it would mean when you addressed a letter to somebody or you were shipping goods from your department store to somebody and you wrote Lincoln Street instead of Lincoln Avenue by mistake, um, or your handwriting was just bad, or you just wrote Lincoln. Like, which one will it be? Um, so in 1913, when this happens, so the uh, local Ravenswood homeowners uh, protested, um, wrote letters to the editor, which are in these scrapbooks, went down to City Hall and raised hell with their aldermen because as they put it, no Polish people lived on their street. So they didn't want their street to have a Polish name. The, you know, the, the prejudice here is clear, um, but it also illustrates the complexity of this kind of um, argument about American identity. The uh, people who made this argument had to be very careful because Pulaski was a Revolutionary War hero. 
And you couldn't say anything bad about a revolutionary war hero, American patriot. Um, so in a letter I would have shared if that function was working on this uh, terrible computer of mine, um, one of the writers, you know, basically offering his house for sale. This is sort of like white flight from white, other white people, which shows you how ethnicity used to be conce conceptualized very much like race. Basically offering to sell his house to any Polish buyer who would take it if the street was going to be named Pulaski. Um, and argued that they could do other things to honor Pulaski. Name the park after Pulaski. Presumably, I'm not sure which park he means. Um, he said, we will put up post, you know, pictures of Pulaski in our homes and teach our children of his exploits, but don't name the street for him. And they raised enough hell that the city backed off and returned it to Lincoln briefly, and then named it for Walcott, who was a Revolutionary War hero as well. So that kind of thing uh, happening is what makes uh, this process so fascinating. Um, there were other examples of this. South Lakeshore Drive, when it first was opened, was named Leif Erikson Drive, um, which people in Andersonville might have thought that was too far away from their neighborhood to really be the best way to do things. Um, Balbo Drive and Ida B. Wells Drive is a sort of a contemporary version of this controversy, and I can return to that later. Um, but the the idea behind the addresses was one thing, and that, that took uh, Brennan from 1901 was when it was first proposed in the city council uh, to 1908 before it was passed. Uh, when it was passed in 1908, it was given like a year out. Um, somebody in this, probably in this room, emailed me uh, about the postcards that were produced. People weren't very happy about their uh, street names or street uh, name and numbering having to change. Um, resistance to the street numbering changes largely came from uh, two sources. One was people who didn't want to have to change their stationery or their business cards. Um, and the other were real estate people because everything was gonna have to be replatted. All these plats are gonna have to be, all these legal documents are gonna have to be changed to reflect the new street names. Um, the people most in favor of it were anyone involved in any kind of delivery, including the post office. Uh, Brennan spent years uh, um, sort of writing letters and, and doing campaigns with private businesses to get them to you know, get on board with this and printers because of course the printing industry was gonna be the people who produced all your new stationery and the postcards you were gonna to send to all your relatives telling them your new address. And the History Museum has a great collection of those postcards, I, they're, they're really cool. Um, and I should quote credit too, this information, this image by the way, is from a WBZ story about the address system. So you can find that with a pretty easy Google search online. Um, so, what uh, the goal with the street numbering was one thing to go with the street names was second. Uh, the street names were about uh, what, what uh, two things that we don't have anymore in Chicago. Well, one thing we don't have very much, but we still do, which is uh, the same street with multiple names. Um, the other thing was what Brennan called broken link streets. And that is streets that are the same distance from State or Madison, but are interrupted by something like a cemetery or an industrial park or the river and have a different name on the other side of that interruption, even though they're the same distance from State or Madison. Um, and this again is the, the sort of uh, <clears throat> abstraction of the grid, right? The street number tells you where you are, even if the street name doesn't on some level. And in terms of talking about some specifics related to, I'll start with Little Rogers Park and then I'll dive into um, Edgewater a little. Um, the street names have these political valences that I've already discussed. Also, street names used to be something that if you were the landowner who donated the land to the city, you might have some pull over what the name of the street would be. And here I'm talking about Catherine Tuohy, who was the daughter of Philip Rogers, founder of Rogers Park, who donated her, uh, her, her and her husband's uh, sort of estate land, the farmland they had. And they'd made money by subdividing the neighborhood for years. Um, but that's the reason why Tuohy Park isn't on Tuohy Avenue is because it's the house they, it's where their house was as opposed to being named for the street. Uh, Tui, for those of you who aren't aware, it's a block north of Tui on Clark Street. Um, but Tui was named for Catherine Tui. She donated the land to the city. The street is actually 14 feet wider than the standard Chicago street. That fact actually matters because at one point, a Scottish Protestant real estate developer had an address, had his business on Tui and didn't like the fact that his street had an Irish name. So he got the city council to change a mile of Tui to Kenilworth. Um, people in Rogers Park were not happy about this. 
um, Mrs. Tooley was not happy about this. And her lawyers told her she had, a, she had legal grounds to sue the city about it because she had some claim to those extra, four, those extra seven feet on either side of the street that made the street 14 foot wider because she hadn't just like, if the city was just gonna take the land and put a street through, it would have been 60 feet, 66 feet. Instead, it's 80 feet and she owns those other 14 feet. So they eventually change it back after pointing out, of course, that there's Kenilworth avenues in other suburbs and um, someone I think did the math and realized that in Rogers Park, the Irish outnumbered the Scottish. And so order and sanity was restored. But again, we, you know, ancient prejudices we, we hardly think existed, exist now, were part of these arguments over street names. Um, people also argued about the street name that is the northern border of Edgewater and the southern border of Rogers Park. Um, and this is one of those things like Gothi Street down in the Gold Coast. Um, I, there's a letter from 1914 or 15 complaining about the fact that people don't know how to pronounce it properly, that it should rhyme with seven that divan is a barbaric utterance, that how could the people in that neighborhood call it that? And if any of you have ever had friends visit from England or even just other parts of America, they tend to call, call it Devon. Um, I call this, uh, you're all familiar with the uh, concept of a shibboleth. This is a thing from the Old Testament where, or ancient Hebrew where, how you could tell if someone was on your side or not by how they pronounced that word. I call uh, this a chibboleth. Uh, Chicago shibboleth. Like if you if you know how to pronounce Devon properly or Troop Street or Goethe, <laughs> you you sh you show that you're from here. You're one of us. Um, so that boundary of uh, Edgewater is an important part of the history of street naming and the folk culture of what we call things, which is also important here. Um, two of the main north south thoroughfares through Edgewater also have really interesting histories in terms of their um, their naming. So uh, Broadway, Broadway is one of the few streets in Chicago that at certain points has a little angle going on. Broadway was laid out uh, between Diversity and uh, Devon to be a commercial street parallel to Clark Street and to allow for development to happen in the Lakeview and Edgewater neighbor. Lakeview and then Edge Edgewater, of course, is part of the town of Lakeview, all that stuff. Um, but Broadway was originally Evanston Avenue. Because it, just like in Evanston, you know, Chicago Avenue, Clark Street becomes Chicago Avenue. You name streets after where they're going. Um, and after a few decades of that, the merchants along and the people who lived along what is now Broadway were not happy because their mail kept going to Evanston, right? This is before zip codes. This is when you'd write a house number and a, and a street and drop it in the mailbox. So Evanston Street, Evanston, Illinois, whatever. It'll get there eventually, right? Um, and uh, Robert Lorzell, great uh, local Chicago writer, did a piece of, uh, recently about uh, Broadway. And there's arguments about whether it was being named after the street in New York City um, or after, uh, or who knows why. But in the first proposal for it in the Brennan scrapbooks that I've managed to find, they called it Broadway just because it was wider than your standard street. It was a Broadway. And to this day, it's one of a, only a couple streets in Chicago that only have that don't have an appellation at the end. It's not Broadway Avenue, Broadway Street, it's just Broadway. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a quirky little thing, but it has other history. So when it gets changed from Evanston to Broadway, there's hilarious political cartoons that I can't show you guys um, in Brennan's scrapbooks, where it's like flappers coming out of the bars around Lawrence trying to get on the streetcar to go home. But the streetcar doesn't say Evanston Avenue, it says Broadway and they don't trust it. Right. This isn't the right streetcar. I want the. I mean, I need the Evanston streetcar. Um, and it's it's really funny the way that uh, the flappers are depicted as kind of wide-eyed people and drunks. Drunk guy getting on and saying, "Is this? Will this take me to Broadway? And will this make me to Clarendon? Yes, it'll take you to Clarendon. But to Evanston Avenue? No, not to Evanston. Well, then I'm not getting on." And he gets off the bus. Right. There's also a great cartoon of a young man talking, asking a police officer for directions to an address he'd been given by a young lady and told, "Come calling." And the cop tells him, well, that's three miles out in the lake. Um, so you were able to uh, get away with all sorts of things. But then after a while, Clark Street comes into play. So Clark Street is, again, one of the streets you can read Chicago's geological history on. Um, and that geological history layers with indigenous people's history, early history of the development of the city. Um, and so that angle it's at, that slight rise that leads up to Clark Street uh, tells you the geology and geography um, but Clark Street in the sort of 
popular discourse of Chicago street names, uh, you get things get associated with street names. And Clark Street was associated with vice districts. Clark Street from on either side of the river for a couple of miles was basically a, an unbroken strip of bars, clip joints, bordellos, gambling dens, some light industry, and then more bars, strip joints, bordellos, and gambling dens. So if you said your business was on Clark Street, uh, there was danger you were going to be associated with that kind of vice and illegality. Um, so merchants on Clark Street, south of Diversity, wanted to change the name of Clark Street to Broadway. Um, it would be contiguous, right? There's that three-way intersection there that hits. North of there, I guess you'd still be Clark Street. Um, and political cartoonists were irate because by this point, the, the idea that it uh, was about New York City was sort of set in the minds of people. And Clark Street was theoretically, no one really knows, named after George Robert, or George Clark, the, the great uh, war hero and Lewis and Clark dude and all that good stuff. Or... Do you want to name the street after a sin strip in New York City? And there's this great political cartoon of a guy like looking up there saying, what, what should we name this thing? And then the next panel is Clark, you know, in the woods, you know, leading uh, soldiers against the enemy. And the next panel is like a stereotype of Broadway in New York with burlesque shows and, you know, guys on the street trying to sell you a watch and this kind of craziness. So the, the sort of emotional weight streets have that gets associated with ethnicity often also can be associated with other things that are happening in the culture right now or at that moment. Um, the, the most egregious story of this and one that I think most illustrates uh, one Chicago way of handling problems, uh, Well Street, um, and I'll get to Ida B. Wells in a moment, but well, the, or Ida B. Wells Boulevard in a moment, but Well Street uh, was changed for many years to Fifth Avenue because Well Street had, was a, like Clark Street was another vice district. And even worse than Clark Street, it was a vice district that had a large African-American population. And the street had been named for Captain Wells, who was the, the hero who died at uh, the uh, for Battle of Fort Dearborn, um, defending you know, the white people who were running away from the Potawatomi and other native peoples who were defending their turf. Um, and so it was thought to be embarrassing that for Wells, somehow, beyond the grave, he'd be embarrassed to know that the street was a, a den of iniquity and vice. So instead of like going in and cleaning up the slums and clearing out the vice, just change the name of the street. Like that's the thing to do. Um, later when that district was indeed demolished uh, and the African-Americans got segregated farther on the south and west sides, they change it back to Wells. Um, and the current uh, situation where you have Ida B. Wells Drive replacing Congress is another one of these great political moments. Congress Street was originally named for President Tyler but Tyler is the only former U.S. president who went along with the Confederacy. He was a Confederate member of the House of Representatives. And Chicago, not Illinois, but Chicago was a strong union in terms of the North town and an abolitionist town. Um, so they didn't like, they didn't want to have a street name for this, uh, this rebel, this traitor. So they changed it to Congress. Um, and nobody really likes Congress either. So changing the name to Ida B. Wells, uh, makes perfect sense as a way to honor the African-American journalist and anti-lynching crusader. Um, one of the most important people in, in Chicago's history, as far as I'm concerned, but it did create exactly what Edward Brennan didn't want, which was two streets with the same name intersection. There's now a corner of Wells and Wells in Chicago. Um, in the buildup to that change, uh, one of the aldermen who proposed it uh, pointed out that, well, so what, go to Atlanta and everything is peach tree. You've got 50 different peach tree streets in Atlanta and well, it's not a problem. Well, try navigating Atlanta, <laughs> right? Good luck to you. Um, and of course, this is also a, a backing down from what should have happened, which was Balbo Drive. Uh, Balbo Drive uh, in uh, the loop uh, stops at, uh, I think it stops at Clark Street. Um, going east to the lake is named for Italo Balbo, who was the uh, head of Mussolini's Air Force. He was one of the founding members of the Italian Fascist Party. Um, and in 1933, for the uh, uh, Century of Progress World's Fair, he brought over a, a bunch of planes to show their military prowess of the uh, Italian fascist regime, uh, gifted the city with a column from Mussolini that is still tucked away now south of Soldier Field, very hard to find, um, which dates it to the, I think it's the 13th year of the fascist era. 
uh, they started their calendar over in Italy, just like the Roman Empire used to do when a new emperor came in. Um, and Balbo Drive was Ed Kelly giving a sop, not to Italian Americans, to some Italian Americans. Uh, the biggest objectors to the original naming of the street Balbo were the Italian trade unionists and socialists in this town who were very active and very well organized. Meanwhile, there was also a whole lot of basically Italian fascists here who loved the fact that Mussolini was making Italy great again. Um, and to this day, there is an, uh, an Italian American organization that uh, raises hell anytime any, any talk of uh, changing the name of Balbo is brought up. Um, even, and even though neither of the aldermen who uh, supported this shift from Balbo Drive to Wells to uh, Congress um, has any substantial Italian American constituency in their wards, um, organizing and raising hell gets results. So we now have Wells and Wells and we still have Balbo. Um, obviously this relates to other things going on right now with the removal of Columbus statues and uh, the general political climate we're in at the moment. So this is what I mean about like you read, learn to read the grid and you learn to see the city for uh, its many complexities. Um, so we'll be coming up on questions soon since I can't share the images I had. We'll have more time for Q&A, I hope that's okay. Um, but the last street I wanna talk about that's specific to Edgewater and Rogers Park is Glenwood. Um, so Glenwood is 1400 West, a uh, little more than a little less than two miles west of State Street, 1600 at Ashland is two miles. Um, but 1400 West has more different street names to this day than any other uh, numerical designation in the city. And by the way, I should point out too that in terms of these plans, the plan that came to pass is imperfect, but there were other plans that were even worse. Uh, one, one city mapping guy wanted to make Western and Madison the, the axes of the grid. And those would be the only streets with names. Everything else would just be numbers. Avenues would run north, south, streets would run east, west, and they would, be, they would just grow from that axis. So picture how it would feel living in Rogers Park if you were at whatever the number east of western would be there. Very strange. But Glenwood is Glenwood until it hits the, uh, uh, St. Boniface Cemetery, then it's Beacon, then it's Southport after the interruption that comes later at uh, another spot that I'm not imagining. Then later, Southport runs out in the industrial areas around Goose Island. And then there's, there's uh, three or four small, weird little, like in the middle of industrial zone streets on the south side. But for the majority of its length, 1400 West is Loomis. Um, and if you spend any time on the south side, you'll also notice that the streets on either side of Halstead, for the most part, do not get corrected on the north side. They stay the same. Um, and the reason for that is Chicago's in, inborn uh, built-in class prejudices. The name, okay, Brennan had principles for how to rename streets, the broken link streets or the streets with multiple names. <clears throat> Number one, if you had a, a long street with several broken link parts, go with whatever the longest section was already called because that would inconvenience the fewest number of people and it would it'd be logical. Right? He wanted to make the city logical. It makes sense. You know, if, it's, if 1400 West is Loomis for seven miles and Beacon for a quarter mile, why, you wouldn't call it Beacon, right? Um, and he also had lots of principles for naming new streets. You know, they should, be, they should encapsulate history. He liked uh, Revolutionary War heroes, Civil War heroes, uh, Native American uh, tribes and, and uh, individuals were also something he thought we should have recorded in the cityscape. And again, the city is a text, something you read. Um, in terms of this particular renaming, though, um, with another parallel um, on the north side, uh, 800 West is uh, Halstead until it's Clarendon. And the people who lived on Clarendon didn't want it to be called Halstead because it was associated with the south side and with the stockyards. And it didn't sound classy. It sounded south side. And that's what people who lived on Glenwood said about calling the street Loomis. They did not want their street to be associated with the south side, even though it's a straight line on this abstract map of the grid. Um, the irony here is that uh, uh, Brennan and his family lived on Wayne Street across the alley from Glenwood. Um, I mentioned this, uh, John mentioned this in my bio. Um, his daughters, he died in 1947, well before I came along, um, but his daughters, two of them still lived in that house when I was a kid. 
And I didn't know it at the time. I found out later doing this research. <clears throat> but I vaguely remember a couple of what we then would have called little old ladies, right? All due respect. Um, who we, you know, we sometimes our baseball or our Frisbee would land in their yard. And they were nice about it. They weren't mean. But I just think it's kind of hilariously ironic that a street, half a block, a block from the guy who, the home of the guy who organized the whole city for everybody remained unfixed, right? And there's lots of it. I mean, if <clears throat> half-assing it is kind of the Chicago way, really, right? We make big plans and we don't follow through, or we make plans and we follow through halfway. Um, but old, old, old um, arguments in American culture never really go away. And this was best demonstrated for me, and this will be my concluding moment, and then we can go to Q&A. Um, well, yeah, we'll go to Q&A, and I'll, I've got a couple of things I can bring up, depending on how things go. But Wacker Drive. Uh, Wacker Drive is one of those great uh, Chicago uh, trivia questions, Wins a Yo Barbet. It's the only street in Chicago with north, south, and east, west designations because it starts and curves all the way around with the river. Um, so that breaks one of Brennan's rules, right? You should not, you know, the, the north-south part and the east-west part should be different names. Um, but the designation helps you figure out where you're going exactly. And it's one of the few parts of the Burnham plan that came to pass in terms of the double decking. Um, originally, the part along the river east-west was South Water Street. Um, when it was proposed to rename the street for Charles Wacker, which would probably be pronounced Vaca. He was a German immigrant, he was a brewer, and he was one of Burnham's biggest supporters. Um, he produced the uh, Chicago Public School textbook that is, uh, was used, uh, the, what was called the Wacker Manual, uh, the, uh, was used to try to convince Chicago Public School children to get their parents to vote for the tax uh, levies that would have to be laid to make the city beautiful happen. This is back when, if you wanted to raise money by bonds, you had to convince a majority of voters to vote for it. This is before the city had home rule, um, which came along in the daily era. So the, uh, the proposal is to rename South Water Street for Wacker. And there's a letter to the editor in the paper, um, which I would share, but I can't. And I've got the last three lines memorized because they are so important. Basically, it says, the guy says, I am a, a very colonial name, somebody, somebody J, Cyrus J. Sounds like somebody would have signed the Declaration of Independence, right? The old Chicago Protestant, New England, New York, Kentucky, original, what they called old settlers. And he writes a letter to the editor saying that old, you know, I got here in 1854, old street names should not be changed. We need to, we got to, you know, who are these people who are, we are changing the street names for? And he signs off, America for Americans, Chicago for Chicagoans. That's my motto. Now, had he said make Chicago great again, it would have been like the perfect encapsulation of the same kind of anti-immigrant uh, politics that this country never seems to get away from. Um, and it's worked out in this argument over street names. Um, and this flares up in other, mo in other times. The, um, and one of the, uh, this will be my conclusion because it's a great thing about Brennan. Um, in the buildup to the Great War, the First World War, uh, Polish Americans organized to take the names of German uh, take off German names from public schools and from streets. Uh, and if you were a Polish American, maybe you didn't want your kid going to a school name for Bismarck, as Bismarck was busy leading the central powers and occupying your homeland. Um, a whole bunch of German street names got changed. Um, several, though, still stayed. Goethe, Schiller, Mozart, most prominently. And there's a letter to the editor from Brennan saying that these names belong our culture, they belong to the world. There's nothing, I, I know of nothing that um, any of these men did that associates them with Prussian militarism. So those street names should not be changed. But many others were. And many parks and schools lost German names and Germans were the biggest immigrant group in the city. But once the war starts and you're on the other side, you stop blowing your horn about the old country, because it'll get you in trouble. And Brennan, um, I guess I kind of wish he might have stood up even more for, you know, all the German street names. Um, but picking, you know, saying that there, there are street names, there, there are people for whom we name things who mean more than just their ethnic or national origin is I think a really cool thing to do. Um, <clears throat> almost as cool as making the city logical. 
right? He has made, we all can, uh, those of us who are natives or those of us who come here and learn it, navigate a city with ease uh, based on Edward Brennan's work. Um, so I will conclude there, and this is maybe more time for questions than we planned, but I get the feeling with 70 people in the room, we'll have plenty of questions. Um, the plan is that John will look in the chat and ask questions, and I will answer, and I, people, other, I'm fine with other people talking too. Let's, let's see how it goes. This is, this is about three times as big as the largest class I've taught on, on Zoom, though, so I'm not sure how much talking can go on. John, you want to get on board? Sure. Hopefully we're a little more mature than your classmates and we'll behave accordingly. So. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use the uh, prerogative of the host and ask, uh, do you know what, what were some of the uh, formerly German named streets and what, what are they called now? Um, it's, um, you know, I'm not going to remember the names that they were before, but a lot of them are renamed like Dickens and Shakespeare. Okay. They were renamed for English writers instead of German writers. Um, in, in the Old Town area, mostly. Any idea where the, uh, where the people in the arts got their clout to get street names? Was this? Um, it was actually uh, almost all street names are the prerogative of developers. And that's a great Edgewater trivia thing, right? All the street names that are from that railroad timetable from the guy who laid out the subdivision, right? All your east-west streets are named for towns in Pennsylvania. Um, not all of them, most of them, because some got renamed in this naming process based on streets that were farther west. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the arts, naming streets for artists was considered a way to make something sound classy. Who wouldn't want to live on Schiller, right? Um, so, and, it, and mostly they were, you know, what we in English departments would call dead white men, right? Canonical authors. It's not like, right, you know, when they tried to rename an honorary street name for Nelson Algren, that would, he would not have been somebody they would name a street for back in the day, right? Um, so it was just about uh, exuding a certain kind of class. Mm -hmm. And Paul Fussell's great book, uh, Class, talks about this, how Americans will eat up anything if it sounds English. English muffins, literally. Um, or think about the names, how many suburbs are named, three, uh, three syllable, you know, Englishy sounding names. Bolingbroke, for instance. By the way, I, uh, I had a Scottish colleague many years ago and it was wonderful to have her visit around here because she pronounced everything differently. So aside from Devon instead of Devon, it would be Glen Lake or Bryn Mawr or Glen Rose or, you know, it's just the, the, uh, the Glen is a modifier, not like the, 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 the primary accent. And, well, Glen, Glen is a, you know, a designation of a kind of Scottish geography, right? Right. Right. Um, I'm not surprised a Scottish person would see the Glen as the most important. But now we say Glenwood, Lake Wood, right? There's a whole forest. But, but we whole, have, but we have Glen Lake. Glen Lake, and yeah, I mean, we've got the so, corner of Glen Lake and Glenwood. Yeah, yeah. So the accent is on the Glen, and it shouldn't be. It's, it should be on the wood or yeah. the lake, not the, the <laughs> Glen. But yeah, or or the the one that was funniest was she would say Montrose. Here, actually, here I'd like to crowdsource some research. Thank you for that, uh, that, that moment, Leonard. Um, I have a vivid memory of a commercial on the radio many years ago, I believe for the Yellow Pages. Remember the Yellow Pages? Mm -hmm. And it, it was somebody doing, it was one of these local comedian types who did commercials and doing it in kind of a Chicago guy accent. So like, you know, be sure to check the dresses before you proceed with anything. Yeah, hey, uh, it's Joe with the bulldozer crew. Were we supposed to knock down 1350 Rosemont or 1350 Montrose? <laughs> and believe it or not, Vernon had a list of every street that sounded too much like another street. Uh. Um, he, one of his principles was street names should be no longer than seven letters and if possible should be one, uh, one syllable. So wow. he, would, he didn't want Alcott and Walcott to both exist or Luna and Lunt because somebody's handwriting, it might not be clear what it is. So you wanted as many street names as possible to be entirely unique and distinct. Yeah. All right, it looks like there's the one attack coming in. By the way, one, one, I know there's a history tied to this, the history of Sheridan Road. So Sheridan Road, this is another, this is a whole chapter in my book. Sheridan Road was built uh, to connect Fort Sheridan, which was land donated by Marshall Field and other wealthy Republicans to the US Army so that there could be a fort nearby so that next time there was a Haymarket moment, they could send in the troops quicker. So Sheridan Road curves and keeps its name 
for its entire length because it was uh, laid out to cross city boundaries. And the city was actually administered by the park district, I believe. And anytime someone called, hey, we got, a, we, we got this part of East Sheridan here or West Sheridan, why don't we just make it Devon? I used to live at 1040 West Sheridan and I couldn't get a pizza delivered. I would have to say 1040 West Devon. Um, so that Sheridan Road is the, whole, the history of uh, labor in Chicago and violent suppression of labor in Chicago. And the fact that it keeps its name. Early on, it was also touted as the greatest bicycle route. In the 1890s, bicyclists were encouraged to ride the length of Sheridan Road. So They still do. Yeah. Uh, John. And, and I can attest the to the uh, confusion factor still associated with Sheridan Road. I was working for Paul Vallis' mayoral campaign two years ago and was trying to get him to a uh, program to speak at 7 o'clock, and his Uber driver took him not to the Sheridan Road section up by Loyola, but the one down in Wrigleyville, so. And there's actually, and I'm blanking on which other street it is, but that's one of my favorite intersections. So Sheffield stops and Sheridan starts. Right. Two blocks south of Irving, and I'm blanking on the east-west street. Um, but because it's, of that. Uh, it's, De it's Byron. Byron. So you've got, a, you've got a single intersection where the southeast corner is the intersection of Sheridan and Sheffield. The northeast corner is the intersection, is just Sheridan. The northwest corner is Byron and Sheridan, and the southwest corner is Byron and Sheffield. Right. Crazy. Yeah. It, and nobody cares but Chicago geography geeks and politicos trying to go to the right place. I guess you can't blame an Uber driver for getting confused, but I don't know if Google Maps can really help them with this or not. Right. I blame Uber drivers for other things. <laughs> okay. So we have uh, one very interesting question here from Tom Hedin. Uh, the grid pattern is based on eight blocks to a mile, and on the north side, the major streets are multiples of eight, Chicago, North Avenue, et cetera. The south side's major streets are odd numbers, Pershing at 3,900, 47th, 55th. How did this happen? Yes and no to the odd numbers. First, the 800 to a mile, the original plan would have been 1,000 to a mile because, of course, that makes more freaking sense. Um, but the myth of the grid is largely based on the fact that most people live on, seem to live on the north side to talk about it. It's 1,200 to a mile in the loop. It's only a mile from Madison to Roosevelt. Hmm. But the streets were already laid out and numbered. Hmm. Then between Roosevelt and 31st Street, it's 900 to the mile. Hmm. Uh, in the 1880s, uh, city council adopted what's called the Philadelphia Plan. That la that's why the south side east-west streets have, are numbered. Only south of 39th does it go to 800 to a mile because that area wasn't developed as early. I did um, not know that. And the reason for it is geographical. Major south side streets, 12th Street, 18th Street, 22nd Street, those are all even numbers. But then you get the canal and the river interrupted. And 31st is the first one where the major east-west street is an, um, an odd number. Mm. And then from there on out, it's regular, 31st, 35th, 39th, and so on. So it's kind of, geog it's, a, it's the combination of the abstraction of the numbering system, not being as regular as people think it is, and the geography of the city interrupting the pattern. Here's and thank you, by the way, I, I didn't know the answer to that question the first time I was asked on a tour for the History Museum, but I learned it. These are how I, this is how I get material. That's, that's a fascinating piece of history. I never knew that about the differences between the, uh, the miles. Um, Here's another good question from Ivan, especially relevant given this week. Uh, did the 1871 fire have any impact on the street grid and changing the names of streets and such? Uh, the 1871 fire, um, and by the way, WGW just did a great documentary, even if I'm in it, you should see it. It's available online now. Um, Ellen Skerritt and other people who I learned everything I know about the fire are, are much better in it. But the, uh, the fire itself, the reason Chicago could rebuild so fast is because the street grid was preserved. I mean, the buildings burnt and some of the streets were made out of wood burnt, but the railroad tracks survived. And everyone talks, this is again, North side bias. And as a lifelong North sider, I embrace it. Um, the whole city burned. No, the whole West side didn't burn. The whole South side didn't burn. Just everything North of the, of the, uh, the address on Decoven, which is now the fire Academy. Um, so vast swaths of the city survived, and all you did was just like put the same road back down, but do it with something other than wood planks. Um, so it did not, and the, uh, the fundamental change that did happen, though, that later influenced how the grid gets laid out, 
is that he is zoning. Uh, the city, you know, before the fire in downtown Chicago, uh, what we now think of as, you know, primarily business and commercial, although it's becoming residential again as well, you could have like literally a factory next to a bank next to a small farm. Like, you know, somebody with two lots growing vegetables to sell nearby. And the, the city fathers were like, nope, the loop, which they defined by the river south to 12th Street was going to be commercial and, uh, and government only. And then later that kind of idea spreads. Old neighborhoods on the south and west sides and, and some north side neighborhoods, including frankly Rogers Park, you can still see the, the old pattern of industry being mixed in with residential with s and Electric uh, between Ravenswood and Ridge and south of Pratt. That's what the whole city, you know, that was built before the fire was like. But if you look at most of uh, the north side, you have little strips of industry along railroad tracks, like along Ravenswood, places like that. But residential is residential and you don't have the little factories mixed in. That's an idea that comes from the fire or the aftermath of the fire. Hmm. Another question from uh, Denise Alberts, um, and I guess this can go out to anyone. Uh, do you know the history of Cumberland Avenue and why it changes uh, south from the south to Pueblo and then to First Avenue? Those are the, the changes you describe are happening in suburbs. Suburbs don't, you know, Chicago calls it Cumberland, but then our, our border is not a straight line. It, it zigs and zags. And just like Crawford at Pulaski, you know, you cross, and I always forget the names of them because they should just be Chicago neighborhoods, but that little bit of Chicago that surrounds or Harvard Heights or something, I mean, they're not Chicago, screw them, I don't care. But, you know, you cross the street and it's, it's Crawford again because you're in a suburb. Um, some sub, And that's a really interesting part of this uh, world. Like, how many, how some suburbs make it a big point to change the names that are coming in from Chicago. So Evanston, you cross Howard Street and your Sheridan Road and Ridge go through because they were roads that predated Evanston, basically, and predated Chicago in some ways. Um, not Sheridan, but the, along the lake there. Um, but Clark Street becomes Chicago Avenue, Western becomes Asbury. They change it. Meanwhile, in lots of South and Western suburbs, the Chicago street names continue into the suburbs. So some suburbs like a certain, a certain kind of independence, although in his book about Chicago, Neil Steinberg calls it, you know, lifting their petticoats so they don't get dirty by being associated with Chicago. Uh, interesting question from Ray Wool. Uh, any thoughts on how the city draws the weird ward maps and suggestions on how neighborhoods can be protected by not getting chopped up? Huh. Well, I'd have to say protected from what exactly? Uh, war boundaries in Chicago. Pre predatory um, political actors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. War boundaries in Chicago have always been drawn by politicians trying to either keep their jobs or screw their colleagues out of their jobs. So uh, Bob Fioretti, uh, before the last remap, made himself unpopular. And so they remapped his ward. It looked like a big lobster. DNA Info did a great story about it. And he, of course, lost the next election because he didn't have any constituencies. Um, I think personally that there ought to be uh, anti-gerrymandering laws on the municipal, state, and federal level that would preserve certain principles which used to be in place, which was you draw your boundaries to be equal population-wise and to be contiguous, um, which would include some neighborhoods being sort of whole. Like, I consider myself as much a 49th Ward person as a Rogers Park person. And I was irate in 1980 when part of, the, part of where I lived was mapped into 50. It's like, screw that. I mean, you know, Rogers Park is the 49th Ward. Uh, some wards are indeed, or some neighborhoods are indeed less politically powerful because they are divided among several wards. Chinatown, for instance, doesn't have an alderman. Mm -hmm. There's like four different, it, it, the way it's drawn, it's just chopped up. Um, but I think using the community areas, we got 77 community areas. And Edgewater's is interesting, right? Edgewater is number 77 because people in Edgewater didn't want to be part of Uptown because what Uptown meant right? De by then it meant declasse and... That, 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 that will draw strenuous objections. From... I understand. I understand. No, it had, Edgewater was its own municipality before. Absolutely. The UFC people who drew the map were wrong in the first place. Yeah. It took till 1980 to spin off. Um, and by the 70s, Uptown meant something different than it meant in 1920. Yep. In 1920. It, it, it took till 1980 because it was not until then that Pains in the butt like Bob Reamer came along yeah, right. and, no. and set them right. Community <laughs> activists, please. Um, so I think it'd be great if you could draw boundaries that respected wards or ward boundaries that respected neighborhoods. 
but we got more neighborhoods and we got wards. Have so you sent that up. suggestion to the mayor? Uh, I, I think there should be fewer wards personally, but I've kind of been talked out of that. <laughs> Amen to that. But, but then you have less of a, I mean, every ward in Chicago is uh, bigger than the, uh, okay, the total populations of Chicago wards are bigger than all but two other cities in Illinois. Only Aurora and Joliet are bigger. Um, so in terms of direct democracy, you prop 50 aldermen might be not the worst thing. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that number is completely right, Bill. Right. I'm thinking, I'm thinking of, and No, yeah, I'm thinking it's about, uh, but then how their representatives work. So like there's whole cities oh, smaller than most wards. Gotcha. In those other bigger cities, there's representatives. Yeah, I, I misstated that slightly. Uh, another question, uh, isn't there still a Fifth Avenue in East Garfield Park? And was it once called Colorado Avenue? I don't know about the Colorado Avenue. The Fifth Boulevard w was indeed, uh, at a certain point, uh, the far west streets were given these 54th, 55th Boulevard north-south, and some of them just weren't fixed, right? And then some of them also continue, continue that way into the suburbs. Like, drug go out 95th Street, once you're in Oak Lawn, you start getting these North South Boulevard with that are numerical, but that was also an early developers laid things out with those those numbered streets because they thought it was a good way to to make the West Side more attractive. It sounded classier, Fifth Avenue mm -hmm. or Fifty Fifth Avenue. Um, just a quick, quick other word on Well Street. Was there any talk of renaming Well Street for Ida B Wells rather than some? The other Somebody, streets. Some, it was suggested, and you know, there's precedent for that. Um, King County in, in Washington State was originally named for one of the early settlers who was actually a Confederate refugee to the West Coast, who had been a slave owner and moved to the West Coast, you know, Pacific Northwest to get away from the U.S. after the Civil War's outcome, and they renamed it for Martin Luther King. So you can, you can say the street is named for whoever you want to name it for, um, I personally think everyone I hear just says Ida B. Wells. They don't just say Wells. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be working in terms of the vernacular culture. There's also only like four addresses on it because it's mostly a multi-lane expressway and the streets there, are, the north-south streets are so close together, the buildings mostly have addresses on the north-south streets. So like the Herald, Herald Washington, it's the addresses on state, not on Wells. Other, other questions from the chatter box. So uh, this is Bob, a question. Bob Reamer threw in a, a comment that uh, uh, John Lewis Cochran would have, he was from mainline uh, Philadelphia, so he would have pronounced Devon Devon. Good for him. Good for him. <laughs> so, so this is a trivia question that I've often wondered about. So besides... Broadway in Sheridan and Milwaukee in Elston. Are there any other two streets in Chicago that intersect twice? I don't know off the top of my head. Broadway, so Milwaukee and Elston, Elston begins and ends in Milwaukee. Makes right, it exactly, gay. exactly. Um, and Broadway and Sheridan intersect twice, once down in Lakeview and once up at, at, at near Loyola. Well, you could say it, it, it intersects where Broadway ends. Right. Yeah. Right, but there is a there are two junctures. So are there right. any other? Three. There's one in there's one in Uptown as well. Because it crosses like yeah. Metros and Sheridan. Um, I don't believe so, but I, that is that is a trivia question. I admit I have not explored. Um, I'm thinking of having a quiz section at the back of my book. <laughs> People can can take a quiz and send me money if they get it right. <laughs> Let's see. I'm. Uh... Scrolling through all the questions here, we have lots of comments as well. Um, this is way more controlled than the usual public speaking environment where someone might say, this is more a comment than a question. Here, here, here's a question. Uh, did, did Lincoln do surveying in, in Northern Illinois? Not that I know of. Okay. By the way, I've got a quick question. I, I'm an architect, I have to confess. So I'm, I'm going to ask you a question about... It's not a crime to be an architect. Yeah, well, so I, uh, I'm a, a, a deep fan of John Wellborn Root and a much lesser fan of Daniel Burnham. And I, I'm interested in the subtitle of your book. So, <laughs> Well, it's not about Burnham's architecture, frankly. 
it's about uh, the fact that people hold up the plan of Chicago as this uh, sacred text. Um, everyday Chicagoans owe a lot more to Edward Brennan than they owe to Daniel Burnham. I would agree. Our, yeah, that's, that's, that's the whole point. That's my whole argument. The, the everyday uh, navigating of the city that we all do, the everyday, the sense of knowledge, insider knowledge. You know, we've all got shortcuts, right? We've all got our little secret way of getting somewhere, getting, knowing the grid and knowing how to get from point A to point B in a not obvious way. You know, I'm not even, I don't even say what my shortcuts are because I don't want anyone else to know about them because then they'll get crowded, right? Well, so you have no shortcuts. I mean, you can't function without them. I mean, that's... Yeah, exactly. Especially, well, this year didn't matter around Cubs games. Um, but so the, that, that sense of, of owning the city or knowing the city is about knowing the grid, and the grid is made logical and sensible by Brennan and, and his accomplishments. And then you start noticing, when you know it, you start to notice the things that are wrong. And it's, it's kind of an ubiquitous symbol. I mean, most of us in this room remember paper CTA transfers. Remember how they had the map oh, yeah. on it? And it's an abstraction. They didn't, the CTA transfers were the most accurate because they included angle streets. But lots of abstractions don't. Like the one here, notice how the, the sort of squares extend out into the lake. The one I'm screen sharing. It's like as though every square mile just, it, it, it's this perpetual thing. Um, if you go to the next time you're at the Field Museum, go to the, the exhibit for the local bird for birds. The ones that are local, they have the map showing where you can see them in the city is the grid. Um, I've got a textbook that was published in Chicago uh, by the Chicago Public Schools in 1951 or two, where the it's a civics book written by Chicago public school teachers. The very first lesson is reading the grid. Like you, this is stuff you gotta know mm -hmm. to be a Chicago, and. The lakefront, you know, parks are great, rock and roll. Um, Wacker Drive is fabulous. But so much of the Burnham plan never happened. And it's just this kind of uh, sacred text people bow to in a way that I personally think is not uh, And by the way, can you please let people know what the full line is? Like after make no small plans. Oh, right. Make, make no little, small plans for they don't have the power to blah, blah, blah. By the way, that was thought wait, to be... Wait, wait, no, 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 finish that. They do not oh, yeah. have the power to stir men's and, blood. And they will and probably they, in themselves not be realized. Um, for many years, and, you know, this is just a, a, a um, permission for a researcher who's got... Um, somebody's muted. Um, a researcher who, who uh, proved it. Um, Adam Selzer, he does uh, tours. He's, he runs an alpha called Mysterious Chicago. And for literally generations, people, including me, thought that that Make No Little Plans line was apocryphal because no one could find anywhere where in, in Burnham's papers um, or any of his publications. Um, Selzer found it in, a, in, I believe, a Rockford newspaper that quoted an entire speech that Burnham gave in London where he used that line. And this was like maybe two years ago that Adam found this stuff. So, you know, a, a figure like Burnham who's been researched to death but you got to pick up the newspaper from Rockford instead of just the Tribune or the Inner Ocean, and you might discover a new fact about it. So, I mean, I wrote a thing in, in 09 when it was the anniversary of the, um, the plan, arguing to make little, more little plans, because little plans are, you know, I think most Chicagoans would prefer filled potholes to one more expressway, right? Um, and I, I, my lead was Daniel Burnham never said his most famous line, and now I've, I'm wrong. But I can accept that. I'm actually kind of used to it. By the way, I, um, there are other cities that have actually explored exactly the phenomenon you're talking about, make small plans. Um, one of the curses of um, Chicago's zoning plan, which is an oxymoron, right? Because it's not really a plan. It's a map of what was, and they just extruded it outwards. But, uh, you know, it makes sense to have commercial on the ground floor on one length of street. But when you take that same street, you know, three miles out, having commercial all along the, yeah. the ground floor makes absolutely no sense. And yet that's what the zoning says. You end up with developers building this useless commercial space on the ground floor that just sits vacant. Right. You know, and for a long, and for a long time and in a lot of places they couldn't, you couldn't even have commercial on the ground floor. You could only have residential. Yeah. Like yeah. the zoning that prevented the classic city thing of living above the store. Yeah. Although um, I've got urban planner friends who are talking about how it's, and you, you can all see this, just look at all the empty storefronts, even before COVID hit, um, 
you know, internet shopping is making that retail on the ground floor thing, maybe not viable. Yeah. yeah. So in, in New York City, I, I, I did my grad work there back in the 70s. So this is a long time ago. But even back in the 70s, they kind of understood that the urban design guidelines for a neighborhood like Germantown on East 86th Street would be different than, say, Times Square and Broadway, Absolutely. or would be different Absolutely. than in Wall Street, or would be different than in, you know, okay. Lexington Avenue. And flexibility is the key. Yeah, exactly. uh, John, can we get to a couple more? Yeah, questions? Lord, why don't we? Uh, m maybe we can have a uh, future talk with you, Leonard. You sound you sound like yes. you know a lot. So, a um, couple more quick questions. Uh, Rogers Avenue is is it the same Rogers Avenue and um, uh, Rogers Park that picks up again in Saugenash? Are they yes in the same continuous line? Yep, they are. Why, 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 does, why did it disappear and reappear like that? Because of uh, canals and railroads and other interruptions. Okay. And it wasn't, it wasn't developed. I mean, the original development in Rogers Park really only extends it to Ridge. And then it goes, the grid shifts to east-west again. Okay. And then it picks up again later um, where it was laid out, where it was like, and that's the other thing. And there's, there are so many maps of Chicago that show stuff that never got built. Um, and the Rogers Avenue that gets laid out and gets built is the, that only that section really between the lakefront and Ridge. Okay. Although in theory, the line continued and at other parts, the theory gets put in practice. Can you say anything about um, the alley streets like P Piper's Alley, were they uh, much more prevalent at some point than they are now? And why did, why did they get eliminated? Well, Piper's Alley and other, in, in the downtown, I would, what I think of as um, the oldest part of Chicago in terms of this kind of built environment stuff, basically like Belmont down to 35th Street and Western East, like the stuff that got built up. And south of the, uh, the south side parts of that is where you see the old, the street grade change where so many buildings, you know, didn't get moved up to the new level. Um, but when you had uh, neighborhoods being developed by real estate speculators. Little, little alleys that could be commercialized were seen as an amenity because that meant you didn't have to have commercial stuff like Piper's Alley is right off of Well Street. It's right off of a main drag. You know, two blocks away, you, you, on Menominee, you don't have anything commercial, right? It's, it's all uh, residential. Um, but that kind of low level uh, pedestrian oriented and public transportation oriented uh, street level stuff really does stop by the 20s and areas farther north like Edgewater Rogers Park don't have that kind of development. Um, one other just general topic on the uh, the alphabetized streets further west um, how did those fit into uh, that was that was an unrealized plan uh, one of one of the many plans that that was proposed that never quite got fully enacted was to start every mile's street names with a letter of the alphabet. Starting at the farthest east, down on the southeast side, would have been the A mile, then the B mile, then the C mile. And then the street names would also tell you like where you were. The only problem is so many streets have already been built. Um, the developers who did what's, uh, some people think it's called K-Town because of, it's got a Korean American population, but no, it's all the streets begin with K. Um, that's just the developers who did that area that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to have it be, uh, to make sense. They thought that this alphabetized thing might come to pass and it never did. Well, it, um, it does to a certain extent. So it just yeah, started it. So we had the, the K's, the L's, the M's, the N's, the O's and the P's going all the way yeah. out to the- On the Northwest side only, but parts of it only. Yeah. Like you don't, you don't have the A through uh, whatever comes before L, K. No, Dave, J. Where are the J streets? Yeah. And it's not even totally regular. There's, there's, ones that don't fit it. Right. But, but that was a uh, system that was set up at some point and they did seem to adhere to it as the city grew as further the city to the grew west. Northwest. And the other thing we forget is how late a lot of that gets developed. Right. Parts of the Northwest and Southwest sides don't really get developed until after World War II. Right. 